Um, okay, uh, welcome everyone. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, this is the fifth Merseyside Fuel Poverty Conference uh, 2021. I am Melanie Nolan from Energy Projects Plus, and I will be your host for today. So a very big welcome to everyone on the panel and everyone watching. Uh, just a quick rundown of what to expect during the conference. Uh, we have an amazing lineup of experts from fuel poverty and energy industry to present to you today. Um, we've, we've invited these particular speakers uh, to give you a rounded view of the industry as a whole from the local to national perspective. Um, we have policymakers, innovators, and those who are working amongst the community. So uh, we hope you learn something new and find opportunities for the future. Uh, about halfway through the presentations, we'll have a short break. Uh, so um, please um, stick around and, uh, and then we will have at the end of the presentations, a panel question and answer section. Uh, we'll be using the live Q&A option, um, which you should all see at the bottom of your screens. Um, so if you do have any questions, either now or during the presentations, just put it in the question and answer section. Uh, and you can also like questions um, that you see, so you can bump them up. And then what I'll do is I'll take, I have some um, questions that people have sent in advance, and then I'll, I'll try to do some um, live on the day as well. Um, so once the question and answer uh, section is finished, we'll invite you all to go to another Zoom meeting where we are hosting breakout rooms. So this will give you a chance to speak with like minds, uh, hopefully find your own answers and possible solutions to barriers with our, within our industry. So post breakouts, um, we'll go back into like kind of the main room and have a little casual virtual networking. So please, please uh, hang out with us there. We can continue the conversation. Okay, so without further ado, let's get started with a very special message from one of our local leaders who has a special interest in tackling fuel poverty uh, within our region and an ambitious green agenda. It's our Metro Mayor, Steve Rothrum. Good afternoon and welcome to the Merseyside Fuel Poverty Conference 2021, hosted this year by Energy Project Plus. It's a real privilege to have been asked to speak today about the issue of fuel poverty in the Liverpool City region and what action we're taking to address it. But before I go any further, I have to do just two quick thank yous. Firstly, to EPP for inviting me to pre-record this speech. So unfortunately it isn't live and hopefully they'll have edited out all the mistakes and bleaked out any swear words. And my second thank you is to British Gas for sponsoring the event. On a serious note though, Fuel poverty is a scourge that afflicts far too many people in our communities and in all four corners of the United Kingdom. The data that we have on this found that about one in seven of our residents in the Liverpool city region were living in fuel poverty. And in 21st century Britain, that is nothing less than scandalous and an obvious failure of government policy. Now, of course, there are numerous reasons behind that high figure, such as more than a quarter of our workforce earn less than the real living wage. 19,000 people are trapped on zero hours contracts, and we have a higher propensity of older Victorian style properties, which as you know, have poor insulation. Addressing fuel poverty therefore requires an holistic set of solutions <coughs> in the short term, we of course have things like the warm home discounts and winter fuel payments, which are a continuation of the principles and support packages that Gordon Brown first put into place. But in the city region, we've launched things like the first ever fair employment charter, which is designed to specifically tackle at source the scandal of insecure work and low pay, which of course contributes to fuel poverty. We're actively investigating proposals for a boiler scra scrappage scheme with central government and we launched a half a million pounds community environmental fund and i'm aware that epp's carbon literate communities project was successful in gaining funding from that recently but we're also doing 
lots of other things were pioneering, for instance, a modern methods of construction program that will revolutionize the way we build homes in the future. And we aim for six and a half thousand to seven thousand to be built over the next decade using MMC, which allows for smarter, cleaner, more energy efficient homes in the communities that we need the most. In the longer term, though, our ultimate aim must be to eradicate fuel poverty completely. Not unless then having that ambitious goal is good enough for our area. You know, one means by which we need to seek to do this, and I hope some of you know this project already, but it's the Mersey Tidal project. And we're working with industry experts um, to try to get this project, which has been around for many years, but to try to ensure that we get it through the business stages so that we can get the funding from central government. And we know it's a, a project that's economically, environmental, ecologically, and technically now viable. Uh, and this last year alone, we've committed a further £2.5 million to take that business case onto the next stage so that we can attract government and perhaps even international support. But with the right funding, we could be generating clean, green energy by the end of this decade, a full 10 years ahead of even the city region's zero carbon 2040 target, but you know, a full two decades ahead of what the government have already proposed. Um, we can provide clean energy to a million homes. Another one of our policies for the longer term is a mass retrofitting program and currently only about 1% of the 700,000 plus homes in our area achieve EPC rate in ARB. So we've submitted ambitious funding requests to government to bring nearly 7,000 homes to EPC band B or C or above over the next four years as part of a, a post COVID-19 recovery stimulus package. Uh, and while I say it's a policy for the long term, that's because we can't do it all in one chunk, but it will need funding from government and there's already an ask on the Chancellor's desk and I'm continuing to lobby him to step up to the mark and be as bold in his thinking as we are in ours. And the last thing I wanted to talk about today is the skills needs for all of those things to happen. And if we are to meet those ambitious targets, as I say, to eliminate fuel poverty permanently, then we need to ensure that we skill up the next generation to help us get there. So the combined authority has taken the lead on this one. And under my leadership, we've already invested £48 million into schools and colleges, ensuring that they have the facilities to provide a first rate modern education for our young people. But we're also actively promoting the take up of green apprenticeships. And we have a low carbon skills for growth action plan, which will enable us to attract um, apprenticeship levy funding so that we can do some of these things. But in addition to all of that, as part of the modern methods of construction program that I mentioned earlier, there are plans to become a national center of excellence in this field, meaning that hopefully we'll start to become an exporter of these skills with a strong world class workforce at home also to cater for our needs. So I hope that you see that there's a lot that we are doing. Um, we can do even more in working with partnership with yourselves and of course being supported by national government. I hope everybody enjoys the rest of the events and I look forward to just a few months time ahead when we can physically meet and together we can push forward this really important agenda for us all. And I'd like to thank you all for your time today and good luck. Thanks a lot. Excellent. Well, big thank you to Mayor Rothram and his fabulous team for putting that together. He's a, he's a, a very busy person, so I appreciate it. Okay, so uh, this, uh, this event would not be possible without our next guests. 
Uh, British Gas Energy Trust has not only sponsored this, this event, uh, but has uh, supported to provide combined money and advice services to over 30 projects across the country, one led by our team at Energy Projects Plus. We are honored to welcome Jessica Taplin, Chief Executive of British Gas Energy Trust, who is joined by Carl Pierce, Chief Officer of Citizens Advice St. Helens, and Sharon McKaysey of Zynthia Trust, and our very own Dominic Griffiths, who is going to tell us more about the services they offer and how these projects are impacting the lives of our community. So over to you, Jessica. Thank you very much indeed. I've only got five minutes, so I'm going to rattle through and then hand over to our funded projects because they can obviously speak best about what it's like on the front line. But thank you for inviting me to say a few words today. Uh, founded in 2004, British Gas Energy Trust is the oldest surviving independent charitable energy trust since our launch by British Gas. We've distributed over 83 million in debt relief grants and over 34 million pounds for our funded organisation programme in those years, including to Energy Project Plus, who we have indeed funded for many years. The current funded project launched in 2018 and I'm delighted to thank Peter and his team for delivering so well. They've supported over 4,000 people access advice, creating budget plans, providing benefit and income maximisation support to vulnerable clients across Merseyside including delivering over 2,000 energy efficiency surveys and hosting over 100 meetings with local stakeholders. So thank you very much. In short, achieving exactly the sort of outcomes the, tr the Trust hopes to see from grant funding. Next slide, please, Melanie. Thanks. So, so a little more about what we do. EPP is one of 17 energy and money, money advice projects who received multi-year funding in 2018. Now in 2020, 2021, the trust funds around 40 different frontline money, energy advice and not-for-profit advice services across England, Scotland and Wales. And in the last year awarded almost 5.5 million pounds of grant funding through the programmes as British Gas's long-standing industry initiative partner under the Warm Home Discount Scheme. Uh, more information is available on our site about the projects we fund. We are an outcome-led funder and we do share our case studies and information about our success online. A little bit about who we help and what we're set up to do. Uh, this is our theory of change. Uh, we have two main purposes. Uh, the, the overarching mission is to alleviate fuel poverty. We do that through the people we help. So we help people avoid the burden of energy debt help them make informed energy choices and improve their money management skills. We hope that this will lead to healthier homes and enhanced well-being. Mel, I think we're on the wrong slide. I'm trying to keep, I think we did, there we go. That's perfect. Sorry <laughs> Thank about you. that. Don't worry, it's quite all right. These online things are always a challenge. Uh, we have two main grant programmes, individual and family grants. Uh, and indeed a direct funding organisation programme, which goes to third sector frontline organisations. Over the next year, we hope to distribute about a million pounds of energy debt relief funding, supporting up to 5,000 full grant assessments with most grants ranging between 200 and 600 pounds. We're quite unique as an energy trust because the grant programme is open to both British gas and non-British gas customers, with about 30% of grants going to customers from other providers. We also recognise that it's not as simple as things like a household cap. So we've got other caveats that allow vulnerable families to apply such as whether there's people in the household with disabilities or caring responsibilities or three or more children. We are interested in outcomes and data, as, I've, uh, as I said earlier. And as you can see from the slide, there are some, some evidence there about the uh, situation of some of the people that we fund. Uh, over half of the respondents have recently experienced reductions in their in income, uh, largely funny enough due to the challenges of COVID. 93% um, uh, are worried and stressed that they've not paid their fuel bill and two thirds of recipients are on the PSR, 46% of these due to a chronic illness. Next slide please Melanie. Excellent. So this is the project through which we fund uh, EPP and the others. Our aim is to enhance the capacity of organisations we fund, enabling them to develop and provide holistic money, energy and advice support to people in financial hardship. Over the coming year, we hope to help 
over 20,000 people access advice sessions, uh, helping over 10,000 with budget plans and helping over 14,000 with income maxim maximisation exercises. Uh, we encourage partnerships. We believe in strengthening infrastructure and building capacity. And we hope to continue providing support over the coming years as 2022 onwards becomes clear under the WHD scheme. Next slide, please. So learning, I've touched on how important learning is. We've recently been working with New Philanthropy Capital on an open access data bank to help charities and funders see the places most affected by COVID-19 and the underlying factors that might influence this. Alongside these statistics, we've shared our data on the grants that we award. And in May, we'll be sharing additional data on the people that are supported through the frontline services that we fund. We'd encourage everyone to have a look at this data bank because it's really helped you identify where there is provision, gaps in provision, and to think about things more holistically. Um, that was a very rapid run through because I've given 10 minutes of my talk to our two partners because I do believe they can talk best about what we do. So I'm delighted to hand over to Carl from Citizens Advice and Sharon from Zynthia Trust who will talk you a bit more about uh, what our grant funding has helped them achieve over the past year. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you, Jessica. Over to you, Carl. Yeah. Um, could you share the screen for us, please? Thanks, Melanie. Yeah, thanks, um, Jessica. Yeah, my name is Carl Peer, the uh, Chief Officer at Citizens Advice in St Helens. Um, we're one of the uh, organised to receive funding from the British Gas Energy Trust and have worked with them close over uh, a number of years. Uh, next slide, please, Melanie. Uh, we provide a um, holistic approach and advice to our clients in terms of energy efficiency and also in terms of uh, debt issues, who have got fuel debt problems. Uh, and as Steve alluded to um, presentation earlier, it is um, unfortunately a fact 2021, we've got so many people who do live in uh, fuel poverty. But the project manage uh, helps people um, to become fuel debt free. So then and the money on um, or the items essentially hoping to make their homes more uh, energy efficient. We deal with a holistic approach. We don't just deal with the uh, presenting issue. And one of the I'm going to uh, mention later shows you uh, what we actually do. We look at the industry, uh, see if there's any other trust funds that can help them. Uh, issues and we also uh, can apply um, funding to apply for funding sorry to help people apply for debt relief bankruptcy fees not only um, getting rid of the debt issue debt issues but also all the debt issues that they may well have please Melanie. yeah this client was actually referred to us um, by in partnership with um, our St Helens Council and she'd be housed in the St Helens area but unfortunately um, she didn't have any white or the furniture to move into the property with her and her two young children. Despite efforts working with, with the local authority uh, welfare assistance scheme they were unable to help her um, because her needs didn't meet the actual criteria so next slide please so being an holistic uh, advice agency we assisted the client to make an application to help towards paying her rent and also um, we referred her to our who can help her with credit card debt council tax debts um, debt and an important aspect of any debt advice service is trying to make sure that their income is actually maximized so we did with benefits team to help us support uh, and that's obviously to obtain extra money um, as I mentioned earlier we do 
uh, look at alternative uh, funding for our clients and our worker contacted the teaching uh, strategy and as we've established that she'd been in then in that industry uh, in the past um, she was actually awarded funding from them um, but up time, um, but we were still able to advise our clients and still our clients albeit in a different way rather than face-to-face uh, -face advice next slide please melanie and as a result of the intervention the client received uh, funding for a washing machine fridge freezer uh, beds doubles, and a cooker and also 500 pounds towards the household bills uh, so she then became fuel debt free so that would make it easier for her to manage ongoing fuel uh, payments. Next slide, please. The feedback obviously from the clients and obviously um, colleagues before touched from well-being and reducing the stress. And obviously the, the client was eternally grateful um, for in the situation. To, so they're now uh, less stressed as well as being uh, debt free and they can carry on with their lives. Next. So in terms of in, uh, impact, um, she was no longer getting in uh, with the fuel because the British Gas Energy Trust helped to um, rears. Uh, the more happier het, uh, settled uh, within the community and it also empowered the client to do things um, for herself. So that can hopefully um, make her become more resilient in the future if there's any other that she's actually presented with. And the final slide, please. And there's my contact details. Um, if anybody's got anything they would like to, there are, I'm sure these slides will be shared later on um, to everyone. Uh, Sharon, thank you. Thank you, thank you, Mel. Thank you. Okay, Sharon, over to you. Okay. Uh, hi, everybody. I'm Sharon from the Cynthia Trust. Um, so we're another project that's been funded by um, British Gas Energy Trust. Um, we're a charity based uh, in Leicester, supporting residents of Leicester and Leicestershire to be free from abuse and poverty. Um, some of the reasons um, why we've been funded and why Leicester is an important area is, is pretty similar, um, a common issues to what's faced in Merseyside. Um, so high levels of um, households in fuel poverty, um, a lot of child poverty. In fact, some wards in Leicester, up to 47% of children are living in households um, classed in poverty, and just a really poor um, outcome for people in terms of social mobility. If you're born poor in Leicester, it's a high chance that you're going to stay poor for the rest of your life. Um, this is our impact pathway. So I think um, Carl's already touched on some of the sort of things we're doing. So we're doing very similar things um, in terms of you know, the benefit checks, income maximization, dealing with problem debt, the grant applications. Um, so some of the things that were coming out of that outputs are, you know, we're, we're maximizing their income. Um, we're flagging up vulnerable co consumers to their energy company. We're lowering bills um, and making sure all eligible benefits uh, are claimed. As you can see, some of the outcomes of those are the ability, obviously moving people out of fuel poverty. Um, those people got the ability to pay their bills going forward. The, you know, the, the unaffordable debt, which is causing a huge amount of stress is written off. Um, there's more energy efficient homes because we're doing the energy surveys and helping people um, put in small items um, and, and larger projects to improve the energy efficiency of their home. And you can see on the impact side, the sort of impact that it's having on people in terms of improved well-being, um, reducing the impact on the environment, making people more knowledgeable, as Carl was saying as well, empowering people and equipping people. Um, and just people feeling more secure, independent, autonomous, and able to move on in their lives, basically, um, and to lead fulfilling lives. Um, we've been very fortunate to be funded since 2014. Um, so as well as the core funding, British Gas Energy Trust actually provided um, over 23,000 in uh, grants that we um, have used to pay for bankruptcy fees um, or emergency top-ups, which has been massively needed in the uh, COVID situation. 
Um, this is an overview of some of the outputs that we've had. Um, I would say the most useful, well, some of the most useful ones are the um, gains in income. Um, and I think as a project, this has a huge benefit for Leicester as a whole, because the money that we're getting is actually going back into the local economy. The people we're dealing with, I think uh, um, another survey or information we looked at, over 90% of the people we're dealing with have got income under 16,000 a year. So those people aren't necessarily saving it. So this is a real boost to the local economy as well, which is a sort of indirect benefit of um, the BGIT work. But as Carl was saying, again, everything we're doing is holistic. Uh, again, people might present with, with one issue, but we're really digging deep to find out what's really causing that. And you can see from the number of beneficiaries to the number of sort of interventions, is that you know ordinarily we're doing two or three interventions for people. Um, it's not just the one thing that they that they present with. Um, just in terms of the actual impact, we did a survey um, for last year, and these were some of the measures that we looked at. Um, we're now working with um, um, British Gas Energy Trust to look at some different measures as well in terms of um, ONS um, measures. But these are the ones we moved last year, and as you can see, it's just had a huge impact on people in terms of um, reducing their stress um, and in, empowering them, educating them um, to move forward. So why do I think the BGIT project is so success? One, it's truly holistic. So people are getting fully supported for all of their needs under one, one roof. They're not having to go to various different agencies um, and they're dealing with issues they perhaps didn't even think they could get help with tackling the root cause, not what people have necessarily presented with. They might come for emergency credit, but we're actually looking at the reasons behind that um, and, and helping to solve those issues as well. Um, why I think um, the BGIP project works really well is it does work with obviously the Systems Advice Bureau who are seeing you know, thousands of people, but also it's working with projects like ourselves who are dealing with the most vulnerable um, excluded people, people that have never engaged with services, struggle with language barriers or to access services. So we really are reaching out to a community that perhaps haven't been uh, supported in the past. We're really flexible. We don't close anybody out. We, we're really strong on follow-up as well, um, which is another um, important part of the of, of BJEP project is that um, you know we, we are following up with people to see how, what their outcomes are like a year later. Are they still out of debt? Have they stopped borrowing? Are they still um, outside of fuel poverty? So that's important. We talked about empowering people and we did a little measure to, to find out um, how this had worked and we thought we'd pick warm home discount. So basically 78% uh, of the people we'd helped in 2019 um, managed to apply directly for themselves in 2020 um, when we called them. So that was really good. Um, we do prevention work as well. So we work really hard um, on another project we have with sort of housing. So where the British Gas Energy Trust project comes in is that when we know people are moving into a new, a new tenancy, they've been homeless before, or they've not managed their bills very well in the past, we work really hard with them at the start to get everything set up right. So they're not getting into the situation of, oh, they haven't registered for their water, or they haven't um, registered for their gas and electric, and they've fallen behind right from the start. So we give them a really good footing for that. And that's been really positive. Um, and also just 80% of our staff and volunteers have lived experience of, um, of being in these situations. Um, just a brief, very briefly, a case study. Um, so this was actually something that, this is one that's happened through COVID. So because of the pressure on finances and everything else and the strain of um, this lady that we helped, her husband uh, had lost his job, that caused a huge strain. They haven't got enough money coming in. He left the house. Um, she, her and the children were devastated. They haven't heard from him since. So suddenly she's got a massively reduced income because he was working. Um, she's then suddenly found out the household bills she thought had been paid hadn't been paid. So that was another huge shock to her at the same time where she was actually ill herself. Um, so basically, um, yeah, we did a sort of holistic approach. We looked at the council tax. We managed to save money by switching her energy. Um, we applied for a grant from somewhere else just to give her a sort of top up to her her income for a couple of months um, just so that she could sort of survive this period. Um, looked at grants again to replace items that she didn't have, fridge, freezer and uh, a new sofa, which was causing her a lot of stress. And also um, we managed to apply to get her water arrears written off, which all has the impact of her no longer feeling like a failure and that she was letting down her children and that she could see a way forward.
So thank you very much. Thank you, Sharon. That was, that was great. Um, Dom, you're next. So could we all see my screen? Yes. Brilliant. So, um, yeah, um, I, I get the, the the easy bit now because um, obviously Sharon, Carl, and Jessica have already explained the project and what what it does. So, uh, I just wanted to uh, provide the, the case study from Energy Projects Plus, as uh, we have also been uh, funded by British Gas Energy Trust, uh, going back to 2014, as as uh, Sharon had said. So, our, our project uh, we call the Liverpool City Region Warm Homes Project, and. And the location, obviously, uh, Carl and the wonderful team at Citizens Advice St. Helens have been looking after the St. Helens area. So our project covers Halton, Nosley, Liverpool, Sefton and Wirral. And the case study that uh, I'm, I'm bringing today is it's one of these cases I, I could talk about all afternoon and I've promised uh, just a couple you have a one minute. minutes. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> so uh, uh, one, one minute. Uh, so... Uh, just before uh, the, the first lockdown, uh, Mr. and Mrs. M heard to us by uh, some community connectors at local charity. The, the clients had a, a broken boiler. They knew that that was something that we could help with. So uh, they were referred into our British Gas Energy Trust funded team. And my colleague, Sandra, uh, was a, able to, a, to provide that, that holistic approach that uh, Carl and Sharon have um, have explained, so I, I don't need to go, go through this, um, but we were looking at more than, than ju just the case that was presented to us. Uh, the, the crux of the matter for, the, for the, this particular client uh, is what had happened. Mrs M uh, had been in a, in a supermarket that had suffered a power cut. She was at the top of a flight of stairs, suddenly plunged into darkness, uh, stepped and uh, she, she, she fell and, and broke her neck, uh, leaving her with permanent disabilities. And essentially, she, she lives in a three adult household where her husband and her adult son are, are providing much needed care with, with obviously a very uh, reduced income. So, so they, they were struggling in, 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 in pretty much all, all aspects of, of their finances. Um, I, I've, we've got this, this, this comment here about a catalogue of disasters. They had fuel bills uh, going to a, an empty property on their street rather than them, uh, which, which had led to a build, build up of debt. Uh, yes, their boiler had broken. Uh, they also had water debt, uh, the water meter that should have been replaced decades ago and wasn't. The family had suffered bereavement. Uh, they were selling items in order to, to try uh, to, to, to just tread water with their finances. Um, and uh, we, we, we heard of, of, of all the, the things that to go wrong. Uh, Christmas dinner last year was literally whatever they could heat up on a camping gas stove uh, in their home. Um, so, so struggling in all, all aspects of life. What were we able to help with? Uh, well, obviously we were able to provide that, that energy efficiency survey and the, the, the advice over the phone to, to try to help them reduce what energy they're using. Because they had the broken boiler, we, we saw that as, as, a, as, a, as a primary thing to, to help with. And within a month, they had a replacement boiler completely free of charge uh, to help them at least keep warm. We were uh, able to apply uh, to um, a, a charity who provided a £6,000 per year uh, cost of living grants uh, to, to, to improve their income coming in. Uh, thanks to United Utilities Trust Fund, we had uh, £3,000 of their water debt uh, cleared and United Utilities uh, have a payment plan that, that's affordable for the balance. We can't provide the usual switching service because of the, the fuel death, but we always make sure that, that uh, our clients are at least on the best tariff with their supplier while, while they're in that situation. And we are continuing to assist with, with that, that aspect of the fuel death. As Jessica had mentioned, uh, that there, there are funds to clear fuel debt. I believe they've actually been paying for next door as well. 
and Mr. M doesn't want to use trust fund money to pay for somebody else's debts. So we're, we're continuing to work to provide mm -hmm. a solution for that, which, which we remain hopeful will end up with those fuel debt being cleared and uh, the clients uh, ending up on an even keel after what is clearly uh, a, a, an horrific year they've been they've been through and, and war. Uh, Mr M says, my wife would have died this winter without your help. Thanks for all your help with the grants. It's going to make a big difference to getting by and survival in the future, which uh, as, as with, with Sharon and Carl's those real outcomes for real people who will be struggling without this uh, invaluable support. So thank you very much for listening. Thanks for British Gas Energy Trust for funding it. Um, that's great. And thank you to everyone um, from the, the British Gas Energy Trust uh, team uh, or, you know. Uh, Sorry, back to you, Mel. Yeah, yeah, thank you. No. <laughs> I'll just go ahead anyway. Uh, so no, sorry. I I know I, it was it, it went a little bit over, but I think I think it was worth it. I mean, I think it's really important um, to see these case studies just to remember why we do the work that we do. Uh, you know, it's sometimes it's hard to um, remember. You know, it's it's about the people that we help, isn't it? It's about empowerment, boosting the economy, which are all um, examples of of what we saw in your case study. So thank you very much. Uh, so next up. We'll move on. We have um, Kirsten Horton from uh, our senior policy advisor in fuel poverty from the Department of Business, Energy and Industry Strategy, better known as Bayes, who worked to build a stronger, greener future by fighting coronavirus, tackling climate change, unleashing innovation and making the UK a great place to work and do business. Uh, just last month, Bayes published the updated fuel poverty strategy for England called Sustainable Warmth, Protecting Vulnerable Households in England. The strategy is designed to ensure that people in fuel poverty have access to affordable, low-carbon warmth as we transition to net zero and work towards our fuel poverty target. Uh, so, Kirsten, um, I will give you the floor. Thanks very much, Melanie. I appreciate that. And uh, yeah, thank you. So uh, we did publish our updated fuel poverty strategy last month. So very excited to be here sharing a bit about that with you. I will keep this as a, a brief taster and it is online. I'll post a link in the chat afterwards if anyone wants to look into any aspects of it in more detail and then, you know, ask me the, you know, the hard questions at the end of the day. Um, but it is it's really great to be here with all of you and uh, sharing this kind of national perspective of how we're going to be tackling fuel poverty across England. Uh, so I'm going to try to give a very brief taster of quite a lot of areas in the next few minutes. Don't worry, Melanie. <laughs> <Don't> worry. <laughs> No. <laughs> but I will start by talking about what our actual target is. What are we trying to achieve? Um, so we in Bayes really see that um, improving energy efficiency is the most sustainable and long-term solution to fuel poverty. So um, for a family, if you are living in a home that's not insulated, um, that has drafty doors and windows, uh, it is going to be so much harder to keep your home warm than if you have a well-insulated home uh, with an energy efficient boiler um, or a clean heating solution. So that's really what we're looking at. And that is what our goal is, is over the next 10 years to be improving fuel poor homes up to energy efficiency rating of at least fan C. Um, and we have 21 new commitments in this updated strategy to help us to achieve that goal. Um, so these are, are kind of ways, I guess, that we see government being able to make sure these happen in addition to our main policies, additional actions that seem really important to us. Uh, so we have quite a wide variety. Uh, you can see a complete list in the strategy, but we're talking about improving targeting, improving data sharing, and making sure that fuel poor households are actually early beneficiaries to the transition to low carbon heating. Some of you, if you're quite involved in the national fuel poverty scene, may have also heard that we were looking at updating the way that we measured fuel poverty. Um, so we used to measure fuel poverty in a way that basically showed um, 
10 to 12 percent of the population is always being in fuel poverty. It was a relative metric. And so it's really useful for showing kind of which types of households were in fuel poverty. Uh, but we've updated now to make it simpler based on feedback that uh, it was a bit hard to track kind of how we were doing. Um, so we have this new metric, which is just you are considered to be in fuel poverty if you are on a low income and you live in a home between band D and band G. And that's it. That's a, so if we're hoping it'll be quite a bit more simple. And as you can see from 2010 compared to 2019, we kind of ran a back series with the data we had available. And you can see that uh, the number of low income households who are in a band A, B or C home has really increased. So we are working towards that target by improving energy efficiency. There were a few key principles that we have in our um, strategy and I won't go into them in too much detail, but one is to make sure we're cost effective. One is to make sure that we tackle the least efficient homes first. A third one here is our vulnerability principle and people have been asking us who do we consider vulnerable. So when we're talking about vulnerability, we're talking about people on a low income. Um, and we're talking about people who if they weren't able to pay their feeding bills if their home wasn't warm over the winter, they would be um, at risk of, of physical or mental harm. Um, so we're particularly looking at people um, over the age of 65 can be at quite high risk, very young children who are below school age, um, people who have a health condition that makes them less mobile or maybe more likely to spend more time at home, and people who have a long-term health condition that puts them at high risk, so a respiratory or cardiovascular condition or certain mental health conditions. We also introduced a new sustainability principle uh, to put us in line with our net zero target. And now, very brief whistle stop tour through um, our national schemes that are available for people, because I know this is quite important, but I don't want to take up too much of your time. Um, but as some people were mentioning, the warm home discount is a really great option for households um, at claiming certain benefits. They get 140 pounds directly off of their energy bills. So the scheme for this past winter is now closed, um, but this upcoming winter, we will have another round of the warm home discount. So people can apply for October, I believe, um, talk to their energy supplier about that. Um, going forward from 2022, we're actually looking at expanding the scheme and trying to make it easier for people um, to access it. We know that the application process is sometimes a barrier for people who really need it. So we are gonna be consulting on ways to actually make this much easier or potentially for people to even be able to receive it automatically. Um, so please do look out for that consultation if you are an interested community group and you're able to give us some feedback on that. The energy company obligation, some of you may also be aware of. Uh, so this is an energy supplier driven scheme uh, installing insulation and other energy efficiency measures, as well as um, some heating measures. Uh, they've installed 3 million measures since 2013 when the scheme started. And we are going to be increasing the spending envelope from 2022, and we will also be consulting on this. So if you have worked with ECO or if you have any opinions on ECO, please do look out for that consultation. The Green Homes Grant, many of you would have heard of. Um, the voucher scheme, can, low income households can receive up to 10,000 pounds towards uh, improving the energy efficiency of their home. We also have a local authority delivery scheme um, where there have been uh, quite a few different projects that have been funded at different local authorities. And finally, um, oh, sorry, one more after this. Uh, there's quite a lot going on this year. Uh, we had recently consulted as well on minimum energy efficiency standards. So for those of you who work with private landlords um, or those of you who work at local authorities, you might know that band F or G properties need to be improved before they are let out um, or they need to have a registered exemption. And we have consulted now on um, raising that to band C. So the band C properties would have to be improved or would have to have an exemption. And we were looking at having that in place by the late 2020s. 
So we're currently analyzing responses, but just to say that that is potentially on the horizon and that's something to keep an eye out for. I know that's a bit of a longer term uh, look, but it's, it's really important, I think, for the long term, making sure that homes are, are warm and safe. Finally, for those of you who work with social housing and social housing providers, uh, we have a social housing demonstrator fund ongoing right now. Um, and we are looking at going forward. Um, the government has talked about doing a much larger social housing decarbonization fund to upgrade a significant portion of the social housing stock up to at least EPC band C. Uh, so that is definitely something to keep an eye towards as well. So I hope that I have kept to my promise of keeping to time. You have. Uh, there is quite a lot going on this year, um, but I'm happy to, uh, you know, to talk to you later during the Q&A and I will post the link to our strategy in the chat um, because as I said, there's quite a lot going on. So um, looking forward to, uh, to hearing more from you all later. That's great. Thank you so much, Kirsten. It's really, uh... A lot to look forward to for the future, isn't there, for a few poverty and energy efficiency and, and just a, a low carbon world, I think is, is uh, the end result, isn't it? So, Absolutely. Um, yeah, so anyone who hasn't already, please get typing in the question and answer box. If you have any questions um, for any of our panelists today, please, please ask, now's your time. So uh, everyone's very quiet over in the attendee um, section. Uh, so please get your, get your questions in. Okay, so uh, does our next guest need an introduction? I don't know. Well, I'm going to do it anyway. Uh, Peter Owen of Energy Projects Plus. Uh, we, uh, that's um, who is hosting this event today. Uh, Energy Projects Plus is, has a mission to continually seek opportunities to develop par partnerships to improve energy efficiency, alleviate fuel poverty, and reduce the impact on the environment through energy and sustainability projects. So, um, over to you, Peter, boss. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Melanie. And uh, I, I confess, did I need an introduction? Well, yes, because I didn't know it was me you were talking about then. Okay. Um, <laughs> um, so um, I'd, I'd like to start again by thanking uh, British Gas Energy Trust again for the support over the past five or six years um, and for funding the conference today. We did originally plan to hold it last year, but uh, of course, um, COVID lockdown came in. So uh, I'm really pleased that uh, we were able to deliver it this year. Uh, and of course, I'd like to thank um, my fellow speakers for taking the time out uh, for their expertise and, and, and presentations. Um, the other thing as well I thought I'd note is the frontline case studies um, evidenced um, by, by sort of Carl, Sharon and, uh, and uh, Dominic shows the extent, but it also shows the depth and the complicated nature of the need that exists across uh, the population. Um, and it, it, it also, it should be noted that not all people with this need are, are physically classed as fuel poverty in fuel poverty, um, but without timely support, they can easily fall into fuel debt um, and, and fuel poverty. And we regularly support clients who've inadvertently slipped into debt because they don't fully understand how their bills are calculated or they've not spotted a worsening situation. Uh, so I, I intend speaking very briefly about um, things that I consider, just three areas that I consider would be important going forward in the delivery of programs aimed at addressing fuel poverty. Um, one, the first one is, is, is access, access to the funded measures, and that's either through eligibility, availability, or indeed messaging. Uh, the second one is the future approach to fuel poverty and retrofit programs, and um, so Kirsten's explained um, the, the, the fuel poverty um, strategy and, and the like. Um, and then it's also, I, I think is really important, is the importance of being ready to take up opportunities when they arise. And that's sort of local regional government level on the delivery side. Um, but equally importantly, it's, it's on the occupant side as well. Um, so in terms of access to funded measures, um, so that's a local level across Merseyside. Um, I, I would say we're blessed, but I, I would actually say it's, it's due to the successful and committed nature of our local authorities and third sector organizations. There are a range of programs that support the installation of measures to low income and vulnerable residents' homes. But eligibility for one program doesn't mean automatic eligibility for other programs. So for example, some are 10 year specific um, and others offer slightly different support. 
But this diversity of support is actually a good thing as, as one size cannot fit all. So a good example is, is Eco, where a vulnerable low income client may present as having no heat or hot water, and they've definitely got no means to afford a replacement. So whilst on the face of it, and it's it's underpinned by sort of billboards sort of online and as media messaging saying, get your free boiler today, they may actually not be eligible for, for eco because they don't say need an associated insulation measure, say on the floor insulation, uh, or indeed the funding allocation delivered through the, 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 the contractors has already been allocated. Um, so, um, you know, on the face of it, it may seem that schemes are available, but truly they're not accessible. Um, also, our experience is that clients, when they refuse support through one scheme, say by a contractor saying, sorry, you're not eligible for your cause because of X, Y, and Z, um, that they think that no other support is available. So this highlights the importance of being able to speak with a local independent organization that's abreast of all the options, um, all the options available, and able to identify an appropriate route. Um, so for example, EP Plus, we're pleased We'll receive, we've received funding through the Energy Redress Programme um, managed by EST that enables us to provide sort of some rounded services across all areas of Merseyside and Cheshire. Um, and it helps clients who aren't, uh, either have got measures that aren't needed through, through ECO. Um, and we can certainly uh, provide them with advice and support and direct them elsewhere. Uh, and, and I think messaging get that message just get, getting that message out to people is important um to ensure that they don't feel misinformed and therefore mistrustful when some new opportunities arise so for example um i mean the green homes grant is a fantastic program um it's had a few hiccups on, in terms of access to uh, available contractors and the like but that that's something that will come up later um as as a challenge across the whole sector but we received a spike in calls in the autumn when people um, sort of announced in the media and, and we had plenty of people saying, oh, can I have my double glazing, please? Um, because the media message hadn't clearly indicated that that was a secondary measure and they needed a primary measure first. Um, and, and Kirsten mentioned, I mean, the, the fabric first approach um, in, in the fuel poverty program and also the move away from supporting non-fossil fuel measures, you know, so um, sort of gas-fired boilers, um, and the deeper retrofit measures that are going to be taking place um, where top of funding could be necessary, then communication and messaging becomes critical. Um, the future approach and the retrofit programs, we've heard about the multi-measure approach, the intention de declared in the, in the strategy is that, um, you know, one visit or one intervention we need to maximize the number of, of measures that are being installed and to try and move in one simple uh, step a property from a lower EPC rating up to that uh, that C target and beyond. Um, now, clearly, th that would have a much greater disruption to the occupier than, say, a simple cavity wall insulation measure. Um, and so they will need to fully understand and be prepared for that impact. And again, the decarbonization agenda and the ultimate move away from the current norm of gas-fired wet central heating will mean a different approach by the occupants. You know, air source heat pumps um, do have a different operating temperature and uh, a different sort of approach. So, so I believe there is a key role in, in all of this that, that our charity and, and other organizations similar to ourselves, working alongside the community, we can take it on. Uh, and that will mean that the programs will be reach their maximum effectiveness in terms of take up and we talked earlier about uh, cost effectiveness and delivery. So the importance of being ready to take up opportunities when they arise. Um, we'll be hearing from, um, from Ed Kingsley a bit later uh, about how Wirral as a forward thinking local authority is, is preparing for these opportunities and identifying where they could be targeting and just being ready for when they arise. Um, and I've already described, described sort of the range of schemes and the individual complications that could arise that would confound most households. Um, so I, I believe that a program of warming up residents, communities particularly, is necessary to meet our fuel poverty and carbon reduction targets. Um, that will then overcome any initial inertia um, and a potential sort of depression in, in take up. Um, so we're we're, we as EP Plus, we're going to be piloting um, a project, um, thanks to the support of, of, of the Caden Foundation, um, to, to deliver um, what we call a sort of a, a personal action plan approach 
it's something that we developed as part of the climate reduction uh, programs. And um, Mayor Steve Anderson did uh, very kindly reference our um, cl climate literate communities that we got funding for. So the idea is that um, we will engage with people both on the climate agenda uh, as a means to explain the why, as well as the fuel poverty agenda. Um, and are clearly the financial uh, drivers and the, and the immediate need um, as described by um, by the BGET funder programs, um, they will initially deal with the, the, the presented need, but then look to move on. I think there's a huge opportunity here to, um, to, to develop property specific and personal action plans with the residents. Um, we did um, an event with, with Hope for the Future just, just last week, which focused on fuel poverty in St. Helens. And that was actually developed as an initial idea but by the community themselves, a the community, community group wanted to, to address what the issues about fuel poverty were in St. Helens. And they engaged with councillors and, and say, hope for the future, uh, developed, uh, did deliver that, um, that event. And it was very successful. One of the key messages from there was about training, about um, what job opportunities will they bring. And again, by engaging with communities, and you were talking about, uh, so Jesse was talking about the education programs with, with, within schools and, and develop, and Mayor Anderson, sorry, Mayor, sorry, Mayor Rotherham was talking about um, at, at a high level, engaging with um, uh, colleges and apprenticeships. But all of these, at a community level, we, we need to be generating the interest and the identification that these are career paths for people. So when we're engaging with residents, we're not just going to be engaging about what we can do in their home, but that is important. We'll be doing an EPC if they haven't already got one. We'll be discussing how they could achieve, you know, sort of um, the best possible um, low carbon installations and then make them ready for the Green Homes Grant or for, say, the local authority uh, delivery programs, you know, as, they, as and when they arise. Um, it makes it easier for the delivery partners to engage with people. But it's also, and I don't want to um, step on Garosha's toes as well about um, the way that agility is doing, but it's also those simple measures and um, you know, people recognizing that there is support at that level as well. Um, I truly believe that by engaging with community members, bringing the community with us, that will create an infrastructure, a background infrastructure that can help those fuel poor, almost disconnected residents to get confidence to engage with, with the programs. So we very much look forward to developing our program around um, the personal action plans, the um, pre preparation for the programs so that when the big, the big programs do arise, backed by the city region, backed by local authorities, backed by government, they are willing and able to take it up. Uh, so I'm very hopeful um, that the fuel poverty strategy, the work at combined authority level and say local authority level, if we can all work together, we can start to really make an inroad into tackling fuel poverty. Thank you. Excellent timing, Peter. My my uh, my timer just went off. So well done. Uh, I think oh, I'm just going to read out a comment. I think it's really, really good that we had from the attendees. Uh, Katie says, uh, totally agree. Vulnerable clients need lots of hand-holding and encouragement to take advantage of the schemes that become available to them and trusted, experienced organizations such as EPP to have a, have a massive role in this. And I think, well, most of our panelists so far have been um, people who, who deal with um, vulnerable clients on a daily basis. So I think that's a, a really important comment. Um, okay, so what we'll do now is we'll have a quick comfort break. Uh, we'll take, uh, should we say, five minutes. Um, so we'll come, well, uh, we'll come back at um, 10 past two uh, and go get yourself a, a quick cup of coffee and uh, we will see you back here at 10 past two.
Okay, we'll give everyone just one more minute. Start, try to start that. And pass two. Okay, uh, welcome back everyone. Hopefully everyone's back uh, from their, their uh, quick break. Uh, well, I think what we'll do is um, we'll just jump right in to the next section. Uh, so the, starting with uh, Neil Barnes, welcome Neil. Uh, he is the Deputy Director of Future Retail Markets of Ofgem. Ofgem is the government regulator for gas and electricity markets in Great Britain. Ofgem's role is to protect consumers now and in the future by working to deliver a greener, fairer energy system. So welcome, Neil. Thanks, Melanie. Let mm -hmm. me just uh, share my screen, but just, yeah, so it's a real pleasure to speak at this event on fuel poverty. Obviously, it's a really, really important subject as we've already heard, I think particularly so at this time, given, um, the, the very real effects of the pandemic on, on households and their finances, but also is given the changes that are on the horizon for the energy sector and the potential implications for consumers around that transition to, to net zero. So, you know, I found it really instructive to hear from um, speakers already about their experiences on the ground in, in Merseyside and elsewhere, and the invaluable support that those groups provide. And um, also it was good to hear from government as well about their updated fuel poverty strategy. So let me just, uh, let me just share my screen. Is that happening yet? Not yet. Yeah. No. With that, um, if that's not working, I don't know, Melanie, if you wouldn't mind putting up the slides I sent earlier. Yes, I can absolutely do that. That was a sensible contingency plan. Yeah, see? Um, yeah. I'm not quite sure why that's not happening. Um, hey. Fantastic, thank you. So yeah, I just wanted to say a few words about three areas really. Firstly, some of the challenges that Ofgem sees in relation to vulnerable consumers and, and the fuel poor in particular. Then talk about the role Ofgem plays in helping meet government's fuel poverty goals, um, the support we've put in place to help those customers struggling to pay their bills and our plans going forward. Um, and then finally, just consider briefly some of the opportunities and challenges that the energy transition presents for vulnerable consumers um, and the importance of making sure that that transition happens in a, in a fair way. So Melanie, if you can just click on. Um, I think we've, we've heard um, from other speakers about the challenges faced by nearly 4 million people um, who are considered to be living in fuel poverty across the UK um, and struggling to afford energy that's essential to, to heat their homes and, and power their lives. And also how this challenge is particularly acute in areas like Merseyside. Now these, these figures don't yet include the huge impact that COVID has had uh, and will continue to have uh, on the most vulnerable in society. Um, I think recent evidence from Citizens Advice found that um, around 6 million households have fallen behind on one or more bills since the start of the pandemic and you know, around half of those being energy bills. And of, of those households, the majority are in insecure work or have been furloughed, they've got caring responsibilities or, or disabilities. And Ofgem's own data backs up some of those findings. So during 2020, we saw a significant spike in the number of customers in arrears with their energy supplier, um, up by around 400,000 to over one and a half million across gas and electricity. And whilst that number has since declined to levels we're perhaps more used to seeing um, as suppliers move these customers onto repayment plans. Um, those numbers are still obviously very, very high. Um, and for customers on prepayment meters, which includes many fuel poor, we also saw some significant spikes in people 
self-disconnecting because they couldn't afford to top up their meters. As we know, those falling behind um, may spend years paying back what they what they can't afford to pay and be pushed into or even further into fuel poverty. And we know that obviously those in poverty um, will generally pay a premium as a result, which creates, um, you know, um, can be very demanding and create a really unmanageable cycle. So what's Ofgen been doing in this space? Um, and our core objective is to make a positive difference for all energy consumers. And over the last five years or so, we've increasingly focused on protecting consumers in vulnerable situations um, and we'll continue to further strengthen our focus going forward. Um, and Melanie, you've, you've hopefully Sorry. jumped forward. So thank you. Sorry. No, no, Sorry. that's good. Um, so in 2019, we published our Consumer Vulnerability Strategy 2025. Uh, which set out the many challenges we observe for gas and electricity consumers in, in vulnerable situations and, and also our priorities for helping deliver better outcomes for these consumers. So this strategy set out our plan to focus on five areas where we think we can drive strong improvements for, for consumers. Um, so Melanie, if you wouldn't mind going on to the next slide, please. So those are the five. I'm not going to go through all of them. Um, uh, they're all important and they're all, all designed to, to work together, but I'm just going to focus on one of those in particular now and on what we've been doing in that space. So over the past year, Ofgem has taken um, a range of actions to help consumers struggling to pay their bills. And the next slide just um, sets out a number of those and I'll just pick out some of the, the key ones. Um, so firstly, at, at the outset of the pandemic, we work very closely with with government, with industry to develop a, a voluntary agreement, which all energy suppliers signed up to, to provide additional support to customers in financial difficulties. And that included considering pausing debt repayments, reducing or pausing bill payments where necessary, and suspending disconnections for customers paying by credit. And you know, we very much welcome the efforts of industry in, in this space and how quickly they, they moved. And building on that, at the end of last year, Ofgem introduced some important additional protections for consumers paying by prepayment who self-disconnect, which as I said earlier, was um, you know, an increasing issue we saw last year. Now these new rules for suppliers formalize the provision of what we call emergency credit to prepayment customers who are at risk of, of self-disconnecting. Now it's, it's obviously uh, too early to tell quite what impact that's having, but we've seen some promising results at the start of this year with the number of self-disconnections among customers with smart meters reducing, um, access to emergency credit increasing, and the average amount of financial support uh, provided, for example, provision of discretionary credits or, or um, top-up cards increasing month on month. In addition to these rules around self-disconnection, we strengthened what we call the ability to pay rules. So making sure that suppliers put indebted customers on manageable repayment plans. Um, now, both of these changes we think will, will greatly help support customers who are at crisis point um, and with, with that longer term um, challenge around affordability of debt. Um, furthermore, through the Energy Redress Fund, and we heard um, that mentioned earlier, we provided 10 million pounds of funding for charities who provide fuel vouchers to support prepayment meter customers. Um, and we've worked closely with Bayes and other regulators to provide debt support communications um, and, and generally work more, worked more closely than ever with uh, a whole range of organizations like, like some of those present here today to share experiences and, and lessons learned um, and really help make sure we're focusing on the most important issues. And more broadly, we're continuing to protect consumers through our default tariff price cap, which we introduced a couple of years ago. Um, and whilst the level of the cap will increase from next month, largely due to the rising cost of wholesale energy, um, and that will take it back to the levels that were seen before the pandemic, the cap itself still saves uh, around 15 million customers up to £100 a year on an average bill. Um, and as such remains a, a, a vital protection to safeguard less engaged consumers from excessive pricing. 
So in this, I won't go through the rest of that list, um, but in this way, hopefully you see Offgem has, has taken significant steps to support vulnerable consumers. Nevertheless, like others, you know, we're, we're concerned about the potential impact on consumers of a worsening economic outlook over the coming months, especially as we see the withdrawal of um, various aspects of the government support um, for households and, and businesses, such as the furlough scheme and uplift in, in benefit payments. So looking ahead, um, you know, supporting customers who struggle to pay their bills will remain a key, a key priority for Ofgem. Um, and whilst we're constrained to some extent in what more we can do to support those in financial difficulty, we're absolutely committed to doing what we can to address the harm associated with that. So for example, um, we'll continue engaging with government to identify areas where, where new additional additional support can be introduced and where current support can be enhanced. Um, someone mentioned the, the warm home discount scheme earlier where we're working with government to help um, inform the design of future iterations of that important scheme. Um, elsewhere, we were engaging with counterparts in the water sector about a, a joined up approach to priority services registers. Um, with the aim of simplifying the sign up process for customers in need of, of that priority support. And as you'd expect from uh, us as a regulator, we're going to continue to monitor the market very closely, both so that we can continue to hold suppliers to account for meeting their obligations to, to consumers, and particularly the most vulnerable, but also be looking to publish more information and in a timelier manner about the outcomes being experienced by vulnerable consumers to inform both our actions and, and the wider debate. I'm conscious I'm probably uh, rapidly approaching um, 10 minutes. But I just want to say a very quick thought about the future. I think Melanie, if you could just click one slide forward, please. Um, the energy market of tomorrow is likely to look very different from today. Um, many changes are going to be initiated in the next few years to make the energy system more flexible, more cost reflective, um, and, and the market itself more dynamic and competitive to help deliver the transition to net zero in the interests of consumers. And these, these changes will redefine how the energy market functions, bringing new technology, new firms, new products and services which all have the potential to bring benefits to, to energy consumers, including the fuel poor. Um, nevertheless, these changes will also raise big questions about how the costs of the transition are, are distributed across different groups of consumers, um, and you know, will inevitably see the emergence of potential new risks of consumer harm. And therefore we need to make sure that the most vulnerable are adequately protected in this future market. So at Ofgem, we'll be reviewing our framework of, of consumer protections to make sure it's robust to deal with any new risks and make sure that consumers, and particularly those who uh, find it harder to engage in the market, are adequately supported. Um, and as part of that, we'll be looking to embed the concept of inclusive design in our policy development processes to, to enable as many consumers as possible to benefit from the opportunities in the future market. And as we set out in our our vulnerability strategy, um, you know, a really clear ambition that we want to ensure that no groups of consumers feel left behind as the market develops. And we think that's going to be fundamental to maintaining the legitimacy of the energy transition. So to, to sum up there, um, often recognizes the very real challenges faced by consumers now, and that circumstances for many may sadly get worse before they get better as we as we uh, exit from the, the effects of the pandemic. And we know that there are no easy solutions, um, but nevertheless, we remain committed to helping improve consumer outcomes and we'll do the best we can, given our statutory mandate and our statutory powers. And we'll work with partners like yourselves to maximize our impact, including supporting government in delivering its fuel poverty strategy. Um, and I look, look forward to the, the panel discussion and really welcome any thoughts on what more people think can be done in this area. So I'll stop there. And thank you for your time and attention. Fantastic. Thank you very much, Neil. Appreciate that national perspective. And thank you for 
continuing to protect vulnerable customers who we all work with every day. So thank you. Okay, so um, now we can say hello to Gerard Grosh, sorry, Lane, uh, Chief Executive Officer of Agility Eco. Uh, Agility Eco is a sector leader in low carbon energy efficiency and fuel poverty services. Uh, their four unique complementary services include funding, designing, managing, and operating fuel poverty and energy efficiency community schemes, uh, including the award-winning Local Energy Advice Partnership, or better known as LEAP. So, Rosh, you're here. Thanks very much, Melanie. Okay, yep. oh, there you are. I can see you on my screen. Welcome, welcome. Thank you very much. Hey, I'm here. Um, so um, th thanks so much to um, EPP for inviting us today and to British Gas Energy Trust for, for, for sponsoring. Um, and apologies in advance. I'm in a noisier place than I'd like to be. So if there is any background noise, then, then many apologies for that. Um, I'm going to counter quickly through a little bit about um, what we do at Agility Eco and the model that we found for combining um, energy efficiency retrofit with advice and support for vulnerable customers working in local partnerships. Because um, I want to leave a bit of time to um, talk um, about um, why we're a bit optimistic uh, for the first time about the future and scaling up some of the things that are being done right now. Um, and some of the things that we as, uh, as a group of, of organizations should be fighting for more. Um, and it's good that we've got Bayes and Ofgem here because we might bend their ears a little bit as well um, through, through the course of it. So if you pop onto the next slide, Melanie. <clears throat> So um, I don't think I even need to say this because Melanie said it already. Um, so so um, as an organization, um, we, we specialize in bringing together um, help and support with um, retrofit to, um, to, to deliver really meaningful outcomes in helping lift people out of fuel poverty. Um, we run programs very much in partnership um, with local authorities, local housing providers, local supply chain partners, local charities and, and um, uh, delivery partners to um, uh, make sure that we're having the maximum impact on the ground. But we are able to um, aggregate together a lot of different funding from very different sources. Um, it, it, um, utility companies and energy companies in particular are a primary funder of ours, but, but, but um, that's not the, on, um, the only funding that we do access. And it's bringing together different strands of funding from different sources to help make sure that we deliver holistic outcomes in partnerships is, um, is, is what we think um, makes our business model a little bit special. Next slide. So the, um, the, the, the primary service that we started with in the area of vulnerable customer support um, was the Local Energy Advice Partnership. That's been running since the end of um, 2016. Um, and um, it's, a, it's a partnership um, with local um, uh, agents um, to uh, get to people who need a helping hand, generally referred into the service by um, local authority, frontline workers, healthcare workers, charities, citizens advice, age UK, people like that, refer households in to us. Um, we make a booking and then a home, home energy advice visit used to be carried out pre-pandemic. That's now um, a telephone advice service, hopefully temporarily, because we do believe that getting face to face with people um, is that bit more effective than trying to do it all um, over the phone. But we do what we do um, in these strange times. Um, the, uh, once a, a visit is booked or a telephone advice service is booked, um, we try to cover as many things as possible during that session. Getting onto the right tariff, energy efficiency advice, things like trying to make sure that people know how to use their thermostats and programmers well to save money, um, identifying opportunities to help people with income and benefits and then following up um, on, on that afterwards. Checking whether the house would benefit from large um, energy efficiency retrofits, such as insulation or boiler replacement, and identifying other hazards and areas where the person need, needs help. Um, and we also install um, easy measures, as we would call them, while we're um, doing those visits. So um, energy efficient lighting, radiator panels, um, um, chimney balloons, things like that to, to, to help people save, um, save a little bit on their bills dur during the visit. 
Um, as I said, that, that service is all delivered in partnership with, with, with local providers. And I'm very happy to say that EPP um, is one of our first ever providers. Um, I met um, with Peter and Ellie um, back in 2016. And on the 27th of January, 2017, I just looked it up, Peter, um, <laughs> uh, um, uh, EPP started delivering um, LEAP um, visits and LEAP interventions in um, the Merseyside and Cheshire area. Um, and you can see at the bottom of that slide there, over 3,200 households across Merseyside and Cheshire have had help from um, EPP in partnership um, with ourselves, 21,000 energy saving measures and lifetime bill savings for clients of 4.7 million pounds. So really meaningful, um, deep impact. Just move on to the next slide, Mel. And this just gives you a kind of example of the type of things um, that can happen when you're able to get that holistic approach. And this is just an, um, one example of an elderly um, resident recently bereaved, sadly, um, really struggling to figure out how she was going to, um, to, to, to get through life and, and keep herself warm. Um, Leap did, a, um, did a, ho a home visit um, and switched her onto a cheaper tariff, saving £160. Um, follow up through the um, income and benefits service, um, finding her council tax reduction and personal independence payment worth 3,000 quid a year um, to her. Um, and talking about the diverse funding that we have available, um, we were able then to access um, warm homes funding um, to, in, to, to replace really inefficient electric room heaters and electric storage heaters. I saw somebody in the chat was talking about how you can help people with storage heaters. Well, we ripped out um, some really ancient storage heaters and put in a brand new first time central heating system, which is estimated to save her 500 pounds a year and keep her um, uh, warm. Uh, loft insulation was installed as well, fully funded by Eco. Um, which added another £80 saving. So yeah, that's that's over 4,000 quid's worth of intervention, capital measures going in um, and nearly £4,000 per annum of, of savings. And that, that's just made a tremendous difference to her life. And that's just one example of the many, many people um, that, 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 that are helped in this way. Next slide, Melanie. So last year we published a, a manifesto um, to, to, to really um, direct some of the conversations that we're having with Bayes, with Ofgem, with Treasury and with um, uh, um, other um, important people who can ch channel more money this, this, this way. And we do spend a lot of time um, interacting with, with Bayes and Ofgem um, and, and other parties in, in this area. And I'm not going to um, spend, spend any time on, on this, but basically we ask for three things in that manifesto and we keep repeating them again and again. There needs to be more money and it needs to be spent better. I think Bayes is really listening on more money and we'll come to that in a second. But the better spending, really, we've got to do better on data sharing. The government's got to get cleverer with using its powers under the Digital Economy Act to help people like us target better the people who need to be helped. We talked about smart local partnerships and I've talked about that already, but we need to unlock business models that can leverage the unique strengths of local parties, but whilst giving them easier access to national pots of money and delivering stability, because a lot of the pots of money that people like EPP depend on come and go a little bit. Thankfully, they've had British Gas Energy Trust there for a long time, and they've had us there for a long time. But, um, you know, I think you'll find often that local delivery agencies are living hand to mouth and trying to find a quid to get to, to provide the next service. And that's not right. Um, and um, our final um, uh, plea was that, that, that um, customers who really need the most help, the worst first, get um, delivered eco measures and vulnerable support. So just move on to the, the final slide, um, Melanie. So we do think we've reached a, a, a pretty pretty exciting moment, um, and Kirsten's um, dealt with some of this, so I'm not, I'm not going to, to dwell on it, but um, if it really feels like we've now had clarity about a long-term future, at least out to 2026 for eco and for warm home discount. Um, we're, we should all really be pushing to ensure that warm home discount out to 2026 continues to have a strong role for industry initiatives, which funds British Gas Energy Trust, which funds us, which funds EPP, um, rather than it all just being about £140 handouts, making sure that that pot of money to do the really great stuff that we can do is really important. Um, Green Home Grant, um, local authority delivery, um, um, looking really strong, social housing decarbonisation fund, and the minimum energy efficiency standards really um, get, um, being there now. I think the minimum energy efficiency standards 
I think the one thing that we all need to fight for is that the standards are continually strengthened with much, much better enforcement. So money needs to be channeled into local enforcement to make sure rogue landlords can't be letting out crappy properties, excuse me, um, really bad properties anymore, because that's what's happening despite there being um, now minimum energy efficiency standards for several years, we're still seeing FNG properties being let out. Um, so where we think there needs to be much more done, water companies um, need to provide more support. The water industry is lagging way behind energy in the kind of support they're giving to vulnerable customers. They're now in a new price control period. They've got this um, water innovation fund, but we really need to drive them to do more because a lot of the customers that we interact with are really struggling with their water bills and there's huge debt in the water industry. Um, gas networks. Gas networks need to need to do more. It's positive that Ofgem has put £60 million pounds for um, what's called the VCMA um, program, which is um, for vulnerable customers and making sure um, that, that they're helped out by, by their gas networks at times of, of need. Electricity networks. Um, I think Neil spoke in the last piece around the potential for vulnerable customers to be left behind. We think the next electricity price control period, which starts in 2023, is a period where there's going to be enormous cool stuff going on for people who've got money. Batteries, smart hubs in homes, electric vehicles, time of use tariffs, heat pumps, all, all kinds of cool, cool stuff. But I bet you that unless a lot more is done, the people that we look after are gonna be the last to get their hands on that stuff. There's gonna be a lot of cost from decarbonization and we have to make sure that the people we care about don't get stuck with all that cost. Financial services, um, we, we're passionate that, that financial services organizations are terrible in terms of the amount of support they're giving to vulnerable customers compared to the utility sector, even including the water companies who are already not doing enough. But most of the people that EPP will be dealing with um, will have money problems that go way beyond energy bills and way beyond water bills. And in fact, many of their problems may have been created by their access to credit cards and things that have, that have led them into debt without helping people with budgeting and money management. And the financial services industry needs to be dragged into this arena to do a lot more with their vulnerable customers. And finally, the health services. I think it's, there's some exciting stuff going on around health referrals, but it's all happening through dedicated people like EPP, and it's not being driven from the center by government policy. Government wanted to see social prescribing, which is where health authorities are pres prescribing things other than drugs to prevent people getting into problems. And it's been very successful in obesity and smoking and alcohol problems, but it, it has so much potential for health authorities to use social prescribing models to help tackle fuel poverty so that people aren't being discharged from hospitals or from GPs into homes that are unsuitable. So, sorry, that was a very, very quick one, and I hope I kept roughly to time, but that's me done, Melanie. <laughs> oh, fabulous. Yep, 48 seconds left. So, actually, very, very good. Really, I feel <laughs> well done. I, pretty, I, I love your enthusiasm and your passion uh, for, for kind of um, helping everyone. So, thank you so much. Thank you so much. I, I really feel very motivated now, so appreciate that. And Melanie, I'm sorry to say, I, I have to go at about five to three, so um, I, um, I uh, won't be there here for the last bit. But sorry. Oh, okay. Well, 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 thank you. Thank you for presenting anyway. You can, you can hang out for um, for a bit anyway. Okay, well, we will say, um, last but very not least, uh, we have uh, welcome uh, Ed Kingsley, who is the Principal Strategic Housing and Investment Officer at World Council. Uh, Ed is going to give us a local perspective and highlight the importance of preparedness uh, to take advantage of opportunities when they arise and tell us how Rural Council is taking this approach and how they are identifying those opportunities. So over to you, Ed. Uh, thanks, Melanie. Mm -hmm. um, good afternoon. My name's Ed Kingsley, working in the Housing Services at Rural Council. Um, and part of my role there is to um, help coordinate residential energy reduction schemes as well as fuel policy initiatives. Um, today, I thought it'd be interesting, hopefully, um, to, sorry, I'll just go back a slide, um, to uh, see from a local authority perspective, uh, the link um, between what we're doing to take action on climate change uh, and its links to one of our approaches to tackling fuel poverty. So yeah, to start with our climate change strategy, 
um, which is called Clue, Clue 2. Uh, it was re refreshed and relaunched in late 2019. Uh, it's a product of the Cool Wirral Partnership, which champions and coordinates local action on climate change, uh, and is made up of a range of organisations from the third sector, public sector, private sector. The strategy sets out the steps required to get rid of nearly all climate damaging pollution from Wirral by 2041 at the latest. Um, and with regards to housing, it sets out how to make sure all homes currently below Energy Performance Certificate Band C that can be upgraded. Uh, are improved to this level or better by around 2030. Challenging target, but that, that's what we set ourselves. Um, one task within the strategy is to convene a low carbon buildings task force, which uh, will meet for the first time in the next few months. Uh, and this group will be challenged to report on retrofit of low carbon measures in residential and non-residential buildings. Uh, how we can lift standards on new build properties uh, and the upgrading of infrastructure to allow for low carbon buildings. So to at assist the task force in its work, um, we, like the council allocated funding through its climate emergency budget to find out what really needs to be done to rural housing, rural housing stock to improve its energy efficiency. Energy Saving Trust were awarded the contract to provide us with a report um, and also address level data using their home analytics service and their energy performance calculation software. The report that they subsequently produced, a uh, final version of which only came out a couple of days ago, um, gives a, a, a better wide overview of different aspects of energy performance, uh, including the geographic spread of levels of different types of insulation, uh, location of concentrations of off-gas properties, uh, which is going to come in useful for, for future funding, I, I think, um, and the main fuel type uh, used in homes. Uh, and usefully, it also benchmarks us against regional and national averages to see how we compare. So yeah, some, some just general facts of note, um, it, similar to other parts of the city region, really, um, that pose extra challenges to, to improving the housing uh, in, in our area. Um, include rural housing stock being older than the regional and national average, um, having far lower levels of properties with cavity walls compared to the regional average, uh, obviously cavity walls being easier and cheaper to insulate. And uh, probably unsurprisingly given the above, um, our carbon dioxide emissions from housing in rural are slightly higher than the regional and national averages. Um, most importantly though, it does tell us what we need to do um, collectively to get to our 2030 target within the climate change strategy of reaching EPC band C for as many properties as possible. Um, so yeah, I'll slip a bit again, there we go. Um, so yeah, so just to talk about, um, about the, the data side of things, um, we, we have um, address level data for, for all properties now, um, which provides us with 85 different fields related to um, building fabric, energy efficiency, renewable energy suitability, fuel poverty, uh, deprivation. Um, so we've now sort of taken, taken use of this data um, to direct us in, in how we are gonna target future interventions to improve energy efficiency and reduce fuel poverty. several ways we can use the data to target areas to increase energy performance based on things like what improvements are required in certain areas and what communication channels are um, best needed to help people across the assistance that is available. Um, just taking an example of what we might want to do in the future, um, the Green Homes Grant Voucher Scheme for energy efficiency improvements could be promoted to areas containing high numbers of properties with poor energy performance. Um, in Wirral, uh, areas of poor, poorer energy performance are generally those that could be classed as not low income, uh, and they're highlighted in orange on this map, um, would therefore perhaps be more able to contribute financially to energy efficiency improvements. Um, of course, it's not the only approach that we would want to take, as we're not necessarily going to be helping areas with the highest rates of fuel poverty. Uh, skip again. 
Um, although, yeah, of course, we, we would help some um, fuel poor households along the way, um, as there is some overlap. So we're looking at where we could target some high intensity interventions, uh, i.e. where the council is able to direct funding to have the greatest impact on quality of life. Uh, it's important not only to look at the worst areas for energy efficiency, uh, but also those areas that have high rates of fuel poverty uh, and where improvements such as insulation can really benefit those on the lowest incomes and where poor health may be more prevalent and could be improved through having warmer homes. So yeah, so the, the, these four factors of high fuel poverty, poor energy performance, low incomes, and poor health don't always overlap uh, in, in uh, geographies. But our data from the e EST uh, has helped us identify 10 small area geographies, totaling around 9,000 homes, uh, where there is a higher degree of overlap uh, than in other areas. Um, so within these areas, uh, the EST modeling is est estimating that um, around 5,000 homes have uninsulated solid walls, around 3,000 have uninsulated suspended timber floors, around 4,000 have no or very low levels of loft insulation, which is um, quite surprising given the, the um, amount of programs that have happened in the past to increase levels of loft insulation. But I, I guess it's the areas that, that, that we're looking at where perhaps there has been low take up in the past. Uh, most properties are heated by mains gas, with around half having inefficient boilers. Um, and just under um, a third uh, have the worst energy ratings of bands E, F or G. Um, all are in areas with above average rates of fuel poverty and where there are high levels of income and health deprivation. So plenty of scope there for, um, for, for intervention and, 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 and helping people. So. Um, our next steps um, over the next few years, we're uh, looking to focus high intervention activities in these 10 areas. Uh, there'll be areas where higher value energy efficiency improvements can be offered, hopefully, uh, through grant schemes. Uh, and maybe if funding allows, we can do some whole house improvements uh, instead of a piecemeal approach. We also hope to get as many private um, landlords on board. Uh, hopefully, the minimum energy efficiency standard changes. Uh, it's going to drive them to us. Um, we are going to start engaging with landlords within the next um, few weeks um, to, to see what their appetite is uh, in, in using funding that we are hopefully going to be able to tap into. Um, and um, I don't know what's happening to this. Here we go. Um, and, uh, and of course, engaging with social landlords um, who've got stock in those areas. Um, it's, um, and uh, yeah, engaging with, with them as much as possible to, to, to help them improve their stock as well. Um, so outside of these areas, um, we of course can use um, direct advice provision uh, with our partnership with Energy Projects Plus to promote government and local heating and insulation schemes. And uh, many of the schemes that have been talked about today, uh, as well as fuel poverty prevention initiatives such as the warm home discount. Uh, we will, though, continue to support the well-established referral pathways through Energy Projects Plus, which can assist people wherever they live in the borough. And we need to think about how uh, we could perhaps link up the, um, the, 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 the grant funding that, that um, is going to come our way in the next um, few years um, to, to these ref referral pathways and networks. Um, so that's me. Um, just to say, if anybody wants to get in touch on um, aspects of the, the uh, Cool Rural Partnership, perhaps, or about helping to spread the word on future um, initiatives, um, please get in touch. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you, Ed. Thanks for that, look, that um, local um, perspective, at least to, to know what's happening um, just around the corner. So thank you. Uh, uh, well, we are now on to our question and answer section. Um, and Ed, actually, someone post something just as you were speaking. So might as well just go right ahead and ask you first, mm -hmm. since you're still on. Um, they're interested in what data you used for your analysis and they're asking if it's publicly available. Um, so the the data um, is is put together by the Energy Saving Trust. So they, so they use um, obviously EPC data, um, but also they, they have access to, um, to, to data from um, Experian. Um, from um, the, the old energy efficiency improvement programs that were run by the government um, all those uh, years ago at the start of the last decade. 
um, and um, uh, you know, census data wherever possible, ONS data as well for sort of property orientation. Um, so, so much of it is publicly available as individual data sets. Um, other, other, other data does need to be purchased. Um, and um, yeah, I mean, maybe there is a way of, um, of, of us being able to um, put something together and to share that with, with people. Um, but it's, um, you know, as you, as you can imagine, it's, it's quite a heavy set of data, it takes up a lot mm -hmm. of memory. It's quite, quite a, 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 yeah, a hefty spreadsheet. So, um, so yeah, it's something that we could look at. Great, thank you, Ed. Okay, so we'll, we'll, um, we'll go ahead with the questions. I was given a, a, a question um, prior, uh, so I'll just go ahead and ask it now and I'll address kind of the whole panel. So whoever wants to, um, to answer. So uh, the retrofit and support program have been identified as lacking from skilled workforce to meet demand. Do the panel have an idea of how we can overcome this at a local or national level? Um, and there's some more questions about retrofit in the kind of questions as well. So it seems to be a, a hot topic. So I don't know if anyone wants to, to have a chat on that. I'll start calling names. There we go. I guess I can, I can have a go if you want. Okay. Um, it's Gar you. Garo Chair. Um, just, just one thought is, is that for, for the um, funded retrofit programs going forward, so that is GHG LAD, home upgrade grants, um, the next phase of ECO, um, all of them will be governed by an updated set of the, of the PAS guidance, a publicly available standard. So what was PAS 2030, 2017 has become PAS 2030, 2019, and there's a new standard called PAS 2035. And they're enforcing a much higher level of retrofit experience for the household um, everything from the first assessment of the property to see what is right for that property that won't anymore rely on the EPCs. And we know that there's, there's very inaccurate data within the um, EPCs, particularly ones that were done some time ago. So um, a retrofit assessment is the first kind of journey, which has to, then, has to be undertaken by um, a qualified, um, PAS 2035 qualified retrofit um, ad advisor. Um, then there has to be a retrofit design, which is a, um, the kind of medium term improvement plan for that property. And that has to be done um, also by somebody who's got another skill. Um, then there's a retrofit coordination. Once the customer goes ahead with having that work done, there's a central person called the retrofit coordinator who will make sure that the work is being done to the right standard and in the right order and with the right customer experience. And an ex post um, trust mark, which is the central um, body for... for um, uh, where all these retrofit um, activities will be lodged going forward, um, will be um, uh, technically monitoring and quality assuring on a random sampling basis um, that, that, that activity. And actually our surveying business, Beers, undertakes um, the, a lot of the, um, the home assessment activity to assure, ensure the quality was, is right. But all of those stages from the assessment to the design, to the coordination, to the installation, which is now really up to its standards as well, to the lodgement and, and technical monitoring, it's absolutely right that they require huge amounts of new trained people um, trained to a better standard than ever before. So it's all very exciting, but it is a good question as to um, how the funding will flow into um, doing that. Bayes helpfully, when, when it launched the Green Homes Grants, um, although it was a bit rushed, um, did put some money into training. I think it was £8 million. Um, but there is a big focus from Bayes now in ensuring that they are um, supporting the Retrofit Academy and um, a lo lots of other parties as well in getting those skills in, in, in place. So I, I feel pretty confident, actually, that we're going to see um, a real increase in quality standards going forwards and with the big increases in funding available from eco going up from 640 to a billion home upgrade grants firstly 150 million then 500 million a year there's a lot of money coming in and it's for a good long period of time so that should give confidence to the installer base to invest in skills sorry that was a bit long-winded no that's okay we have uh, uh kirsten did you have your hand up 
You know, I mean, I was going to cover some of the same things. So I think, I think we're fine. Basically, I think the main thing is having this longer term funding, I think should give confidence to the industry. Of course, the trust mark does require higher standards, but that should also should give confidence to consumers that they're going to be getting the right measures in the right order to the right standard. Um, and BASE has, in addition to the, the funding that was just mentioned, um, we also have been, for the last couple of years, been doing some local pilots on building the supply chain and making sure that the energy efficiency supply chain uh, works well together. So I can post our year two evaluation that just came out in the chat. Great, great insider information. I like it. <laughs> well, for us anyway, that's great. Thank you, Christian. Thank you. Can I, can uh, I come in as well, uh, Melanie, on that one? Yes, absolutely. Hot topic. Go ahead. Um, thank you, Peter. Uh, uh, j j yeah, just a quick update. Yeah, a, a quick update on the um, city region. Um, I attended a, a climate partnership meeting yesterday and the, the city region and the combined authority across uh, Liverpool city region has, has got sort of ambitious plans around training. But a couple of things that came up were also um, about feeding in, as I, say, as I said earlier, job opportunities and apprenticeships. And one of the things they identified was we need to look at the education system also so that um, courses aren't sort of standing and starting and following academic years you know we need a rolling program of of intake um so that we can actually then create the workforce of the future um so that that's a, another thing that does also need to be put in but um it's a huge um opportunity for business development and i suspect and uh, kirsten will probably uh, confirm this is there'll be huge competition across regions um to say hey we're the best come and talk to us um but uh, i definitely know that um liverpool city region is a place to be talking to about as i say that skills and training uh, ambitions great thank you peter okay so we'll we'll, um, we'll see how many questions we can get in in the next couple of minutes so we have one about decarbonization. Um, so how do we navigate the decarbonization challenge in a way which doesn't exuberate fuel poverty, um, but also moves fast enough to stay with demanding carbon budgets en route to net zero? That's a good question. Does anyone want to pick that up? Happy to have a go. I mean, it's Thank a good you, question. Neil. Thank you. It's a good question. It's a massive question as well. It is, yeah. Well, let's um, try to let me give you a couple of minutes. <laughs> um, <laughs> I mean, one point is is moving towards a more flexible energy system is, you know, it stands to benefit all consumers, you know, really trying to keep the cost of the system down, avoiding additional investment needed um, and, and keeping things like wholesale prices from going higher than they otherwise would do. And so that that stands to benefit all. Obviously, within that, there's there's the potential for winners and losers, and you know how the costs and benefits of of the energy transition are, are shared out. And that's something that we're acutely aware of, and government as well. And we're supporting them. I think Bayes is is planning to issue a call for evidence very soon on on this very issue of um, you know, how energy consumers are, are going to pay for the transition and the issues within that around fairness and affordability. Um, so in th that's, you know, I think that links to the Treasury's wider net zero review from a regulatory perspective. Right, I touched on a few issues there. I think important that in in designing the rules around the energy market, we make sure that that's as accessible as possible for as many customers and, um, you know, really trying to drive suppliers and others to make sure when they are designing some of these new tariffs and we've had some questions around uh, some, some smart, innovative tariffs that you know we're going to need to see, making sure that they're they're designed in a way that um, as many people as possible can engage with um, and can can get the benefits from. I mean, likewise, I mean, decisions we make will have distributional impacts. So we we set out a, a new way of making sure that um, we can be really transparent about the sorts of effects our policy changes will have on different groups of consumers. Um, and, and being really conscious of those um, those sort of effects, so that we can, you know, minimise um, poor outcomes there, but also think about policies that we could introduce to to mitigate some of those effects on on um, you know particularly some of the more vulnerable consumers in society. Um, so it's, it's something that we'll need to be thought of, you know, right across the policies that we need to to achieve 
net zero. Thank, thank you, Neil. Thank you. Anyone else? I think I think that was a, a pretty thorough answer. So we'll move on. So I think uh, there's a, well, I suppose it's a good one about energy efficiency. So isn't the biggest problem for homes in the UK lack of insulation? Is it? Or is it something else? Does anyone know? Can, can I just can I shall I jump in there just with a? Sure. I, I, Thank you, Peter. I, I don't know whether it is the biggest problem. <laughs> I don't have the stats in front of me, but uh, but it is a significant problem, um, and it links directly to the decarbonisation and our climate change targets as well. Um, so we, um, it's it's written into the field we need to future proof our properties and we do that by insulating them um, that means we need to all join together to align our programs and that that's actually is going to help us achieve our targets peter can i just jump in there as well because because i uh, what i'd like to add from a sort of funder perspective is that I don't think it's just about the insulation measures. I, I think it's also about the holistic support that these vulnerable households are getting, which is, I think we've touched on it several times about the conference. There's the physical and the practical, what you're doing in the house, but then there's the support that the individuals are getting to enable them to, to, to manage their household budgets, to be able to take control of their finances and to be uh, aware of the choices that they can make to ensure that they're not left behind. And I think it's how do we support people with training education, reaching out to them to ensure that no one is left behind in that journey, as well as the pragmatic fill and insulation will replace with double glazing. It's how we reaching out communities who currently might not have a gas boiler and are still existing off coal and don't have heating. It's how are we opening that dialogue with them? And I think that's so important with the collaborative partnership approach to addressing these issues and coming together from across the sectors. And I think when we see projects that work really well, if I'm, they do do that. And Garoj touched on it earlier as well. It's about how, how do we all come together um, because there's mental health, there's, 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 there's health, there's mental health, there's, there's a whole gamut of challenges facing these households and by fixing just one silo of it, we're not going to tackle it. So it's not insulation alone, I suppose, is what I'd say. Fantastic. Thank you very much. Great insight. Okay, so I think we'll, I think we'll do one more and then we'll, we'll head off um, to the breakouts. Which one will we choose? Um, Okay, well, well, we'll go on to, uh, how about green green energy? So the mayor mentioned earlier, um, uh, tidal, um, his, his tidal energy um, and, and his green energy. So how can we make sure um, that the, because he, he mentioned earlier about 1 million homes being um, generated energy from his tidal project, but how can we make sure that this fuel and that this green energy uh, is accessible to um, poor, a few poor households. So how can we make sure um, that it goes in the right places? Any comments on green energy? I'm happy to comment on this if that would be okay. helpful. Thank you. Um, so one of the things that was really important to us in this fuel poverty strategy is to make sure that actually people who are living on a lower income or are living in fuel poverty can benefit from the benefits of decarbonization. Um, so in particular, our home upgrade grant that we're looking at bringing in from 2022 should be really beneficial on this. Uh, we're looking at helping homes off the gas grid, um, potentially with owner occupiers who are in fuel poverty or the, you know, to be confirmed, obviously the subject of consultation. Um, looking at these these lower income households and and supporting them to have full works of insulation and moving over to a lower carbon heating source as well if they choose so that they can benefit from becoming a completely green household and having lower bills at the same time okay can, can i also offer um the the um the other idea potentially um, is for um, local sort of uh, networks um, directly connecting to 
uh, renewable sources. Um, I'm aware, obviously, of the of the pilot programs, for example, in, in Bethesda and Wales and the like, where they're they're sleeving through uh, things. But it's maybe something for off gem, isn't it? Because one of the standard uh, uh, problems identified is that you know it's so costly to even enter that sort of market for and complicated. So I wonder if, if maybe Neil has any insights as to whether he thinks that's something that's going to come down the track or in fact it may be a lame duck. You're on mute, Neil. <laughs> Sorry, I, I missed I missed a key bit of what Peter was saying in terms of what you think might be coming down the track. And so, so local energy grids uh, connected okay. directly to renewable generation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I think you know that's one of a range of um, potential developments that don't neatly fit with the way the energy system has been structured and certainly was set up 30 years ago. Mm -hmm. um, so you know we we do see and one of one of my responsibilities is our innovation link service where people with innovative ideas come to us and and we we look at ways in which we can try and enable um, new business models and new products and services to to work and. If, um, by by flexing bits of the the current rules, um, and I think it's it's fair to say in that space some of you know what what local energy schemes want to do just you know sits quite ill at ease with the way the current the current legislative framework, let alone the regulatory framework, is set up in that space. But that's something we're we're really mindful of, and part of the work we're doing at the moment is trying to think about for that future market how can we enable a much wider range of of propositions recognizing recognizing the potential for you know local energy um you know all sorts of other propositions as as things that could prove to be really compelling and beneficial offerings for consumers um and you know it enables a lot more perhaps specialization in different areas to be able to tailor to what what different consumer groups in different regions need um but it's fair to say and i um something i've discussed with with Bay's colleagues quite often is it's that's yeah uh, it's quite challenging as to how to to fit that into the current structure of the market in many cases very good well we we have we had a very ambitious uh schedule today so thank you very much for bearing with us even though we are a little bit late so we'll 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 end um we'll end the question and answer session there so thank you very much for all your contributions i hope everyone has uh definitely learned something new today or found a new opportunity or um something something to think about so you know spotlight everyone so okay so what we're going to do now is uh we are going to start part two of the conference which is the breakout session. So uh, in a few minutes, I'm going to put a link in the chat box. Uh, you should uh, have also received an email uh, to the breakout rooms. Uh, so you just click on that and then where the Energy Projects Plus team will be waiting for you to dis start discussions on online community engagements, um, retrofit uh, technology and financial barriers, and then the green um, how green are vulnerable clients, we want to know. Uh, but before we go, I just want to express my sincerest thanks to the panelists. Uh, thank you very much uh, for joining us here today and for all of your wonderful insights uh, on all the different things that, that we're doing. I think we've given a really good um, perspective from uh, the uh, a national perspective all the way down to um, the individual and how all of our work impacts uh, everyone. Uh, so thank you for your expertise and insights. And then uh, a thanks to Ed Lamb, who uh, from Rethink Now, who's helped with the IT. Uh, special um, shout out to British Gas Energy Trust for sponsoring the event today, uh, and also for Energy Projects Plus for making this conference possible. Uh, a final thanks to all of our attendees for coming today. Uh, I look forward to seeing you all in the breakout sessions. Um, but for everyone who can't join us for the breakouts or if you're watching the video later on, uh, just say thank you and goodbye.